Can you imagine that? A life without energy, without, without lights, without a projector, without this microphone even, without your phones that you can check if this presentation is too boring? <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to imagine, and yet uh, there's still more than two billion people around the world who have no access to modern forms of energy. Um, on the one hand, um, I think uh, Louis already told yesterday what this problem is, why so many people don't have access to energy, um, and I don't have to repeat that. There's um, weak governments, lack of infrastructure, a lot of people living in rural areas that you can't really access. And then also Christina gave a great presentation of why service design and having good services in the energy sector is so tricky, because it's so abstract and nobody really understands it. So uh, how, can you, how can you bring that uh, to customers? Um, and so... My name is Clara, and this is my struggle um, for change. So bring access to energy into those areas where it looks like that. Um, firstly, I want to start a little bit by explaining what Mobisol actually does. So I crafted this little sketch here, and it shows um, the basic thing we have. So of course, we want to bring uh, access to energy somewhere, so we need to have that energy technology. In our case, we opted for a um, PV solar system that's photovoltaics, and it basically has a panel on the roof that uh, generates electricity from the sun. Um, you have a battery that you can also store the energy because you need the light at night, um, some cabling and some lights. Um, and our systems, they're designed to be big enough to, you know, run a lot of lights. Um, you can charge your phones and you can run small appliances like a laptop or a TV or a small efficient fridge. Um, before I go on, maybe I talk a little bit more about that sticky man. So uh, our customers, they're very far away in, in rural Africa. And uh, I think not a lot of you have been there. So let me... Um, show you a small customer profile. So this is one of our typical customers. Joseph, he lives in a rural village in Tanzania, just south of Mount Mero. He has four kids um, and a wife. He works as a picky driver, so that's a kind of a taxi driver just with motorcycles. But he's also a farmer um, and he's a trader because he frequently visits his son in Dar es Salaam and then does some business on the way. And that's actually quite common in Tanzania to have two or three income sources. And it's also very messy to, um, to understand those customers. Um, up till now, he has used kerosene for his lights that he purchases every week. And also, like every Tanzanian, he has a phone and he needs to charge that. So he goes into the um, village shop every once in a while to get it charged. Um, he has been waiting to also get a connection to the utility, um, but he has been waiting in vain, just like 90% of all the other Tanzanians. So to explain a bit more what we do, I'm not going to focus anymore on this energy technology because it's actually not so important, but I rather want to focus on, on two technology enablers that we use. Um, one is that very old Nokia phone that Joseph is using, um, and the other one is actually a small Internet of Things technology that we use to connect each of our systems to ourselves and know what's going on. Um, we do that... It's a bit hard to see. Um, we can do that because the mobile revolution has actually really taken place in sub-Saharan Africa and many other developing countries. So mobile network is everywhere and that's what we can piggyback on. To explain the ecosystem, it would be a bit complex, um, but that's what services are, right? So um, I'll take it slow. So we have, um, we have Joseph here and our service ecosystem needs to accomplish three goals. Firstly, energy technologies like uh, solar systems, they are very expensive and we need to make that more affordable to Joseph. Then we need to guarantee long-term access, so we need to make sure that the system is working not only in the first half year, but for longer. Um, and then we need to increase the availability because Joseph, he lives very far away. There's no proper um, roads going to his home and we need to make sure that he can still buy our technology. So we have a threefold approach. Um, firstly, we pre-finance the system. So we lend um, money from banks um, and then our customers, they can pay us back within three years. And they can do that because they have money on their phones. Mobile banking, um, I don't know if any of you heard M-Pesa, is very common in, uh, in, in developing countries. And he can just use his phone from anywhere to pay us back on a monthly basis. The second thing is that 
we use our Internet of Things technology um, not only to find out what's going on and if our systems are still functioning, but also to provide proper maintenance to Joseph. Um, we can see on our screens what's going on and if the system needs any kind of uh, support. And then we have a local network of trained technicians that on their smartphone see what's going on and can approach Joseph and just repair his system. Um, and we do that for free because we want to make sure that the system functions and he keeps paying us back. And then lastly, we really had to be in those rural areas. At first we thought, okay, maybe there's someone doing the distribution there, but unfortunately Coca-Cola is not really transporting solar systems yet. So <laughs> we had to do it ourselves and we set up our own structure and uh, are in those markets that Joseph can really still reach with his, with his bike. Um, and we can manage that because we have a very decentralized logistical network that also piggybacks on the existing mobile network that we have there. I think that was still a bit abstract, so I want to try and show a little movie that shows what we provide. Okay, so it's a bit cheesy, but I think it, it gets the message across. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, okay, now I'm through the what do we actually provide, and now you might wonder how did we do it? How did we use service design um, to, to develop something like that? Um, and the first thing we did was we started very early. We were just like, you know, a, a bunch of German engineers um, and we got together, crafted this very ugly prototype that you can see here, just with stuff from uh, Bauhaus. Um, and we got our 100 customers to do a pilot phase with. Um, and we iterated a lot. We changed um, our product a lot of times. We changed our, uh, our service model a whole time. Um, and because our prototype was so ugly, it was much easier to get honest feedback from our customers. Um, so that worked very well. And uh, it allowed us to kick out a lot of features that we originally planned, but realized, ah, oh, yeah, we don't really need that. We need something else. So yeah, prototyping and iteration was very helpful. Um, the second uh, thing that we used was kind of the overall approach because we realized, okay, our customers, they're so far away from us and we, we can't just develop something for ourselves like sometimes we, we do here when we develop something new, um, but we had to really go there. So all of our um, employees or everyone who was involved really went to Tanzania, stayed there for some time, had to, you know, build stuff uh, with a lack of electricity and could really feel how that like. Um, so experience the context and get in touch with customers was really important. Um, and we try to keep that user-centric culture even though uh, we are much bigger now. So, for example, we, um, we have pictures of our customers everywhere in our company. Um, we still go down there a lot. Um, we have a full-fledged Tanzanian living room in our office so that you can go in there for immersion. So um, that's how we try to keep the spirit alive. 
And then a third thing is, of course, we get a whole lot of data from our little Internet of Things uh, technology there. So we know about performance of the systems, we know about the payment patterns from our customers, we know how they use the system, um, and so that's a lot of stuff. But we try to um, mix that with qualitative data. So we still go and visit our customers at home, we use cultural probes, like in this example, and we, and we try to combine those two um, sets of data to, um, to really create meaningful insights and further improve our product. Um, all right, so my last part is how far are we yet? So um, Olga already said in 2011 we start and then in 2012 I was for the first time at the sustainable sustainability jam and explaining our little pilot phase and was really proud that we had 200 customers uh, that are actually paying for us and uh, very exciting. Um, so now um, it looks a little different. Um, this is a Photoshop picture, I'm honest, but the, <laughs> the, the reality is actually uh, not that much different. And we have already more than 30,000 households um, electrified. Um, and when you have like more than five people in a household, that means that we have already given access to more than 100,000 people um, in Tanzania and, uh, and Rwanda. And it's pretty great. And we have um, our already this 300 employees is outdated. We are more than 350 employees now um, active in East Africa and looking where else to go. So, and the majority of those employees is East African, by the way. Um, to show that our model really has the ability to scale. I have two numbers here. First, the, they don't really look that different, um, but I want to explain briefly that the total number of systems that we installed in all of 2013 is on the left. So that was like not even 2,500 systems. And at that time, we were very proud. We thought, oh man, we have like 10 systems a week or, um, and growing fast. But on the right-hand side, you see how much we sold last month. And that was more than we sold in all of 2013. So we're really um, aiming to you know, get scale and electrify those 2 billion people that are still out there. Um, and then the last impact that I'm actually very proud of is um, our customers, they're actually pretty happy with us. So um, it's not only that they are happy that they have any type of energy, but uh, they, they like uh, our solar systems so much that um, our customer recommends customer program, which is exactly what it sounds like, customers recommending other customers, is by far the most successful one. Um, so we can really build on our customers for further marketing. So I have two more minutes left, and I just want to um, go and make three statements that hopefully you can take away the, from this presentation. Um, the first one is, you know, if a group of East German engineers can apply service design and create something mean meaningful for a, a Tanzanian farmer, I think everyone can. Uh, so it's always a combination of culture and you know, using different type of templates and methods. So that's really one message that I want to spread. The second one is, um, I know it's pretty great that soon my sneakers, they can talk to my doctor and my fridge can talk to my supermarket, um, but I think maybe service design is ready to move further than just, you know, turning okay services into great ones, but, you know, really, you know, making a difference in the world and serving all those people that are still unserved in the world. So that's one I want to take away. And then lastly, um, I think serving the underserved is not, you know, it's not a pain in the ass. You don't have to, um, you don't have to struggle all the time. It's actually very exciting because we've seen so many opportunities for leapfrogging there, right? People, they never had fixed lines and they directly went from no communication to mobile phones, which is, um, which is much more easier. Um, they also went from having no access to banks to directly having the money on their phones. Um, we also try to leapfrog by, you know, providing renewable energy instead of going that normal path through fossil fuels. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, other opportunities for this leapfrogging and really, you know, not seeing this thing as um, a desert where nothing's going on, but really as a green field for innovation. And uh, I want to encourage you to, um, to also look into that. Um, and thank you for your time. <laughs>